All right, so um, today we need to finish up the lymphatic system, and we need to finish up, or we need to start respiratory system. And we were just at the point of uh, attack. Um, remember, we had three steps. Anyone remember those three steps? We started with um, recognition, which was like the last 25 minutes of lecture last week, and now we've made it to attack. Recognition, attack, and then we're going to build memory. Okay, so there's a variety of things that happen during an immune attack, and after we've recognized and we've built our army, we invade the tissue that has the uh, active invasion or infection, whatever the case may be. Now our T helper cells secrete interleukins. And these interleukins are going to have or exert three effects. I think this is right where we left off on Friday. So those three effects that are going to be exerted with the excretion of these interleukins by the TH, the helper cells, the interleukins will attract natural killer cells and neutrophils. Can we pull some shades? Get rid of some of the glare. Okay, so the natural killer cells and neutrophils are attracted to the site of infection. The interleukins are also going to attract mac macrophages to increase phagocytic activity. And then finally, the leukins will stimulate T and B cell maturation. So stimulate T and B cell maturation. Okay, so this all really primes so that we can begin to actually eradicate any infectious microorganisms or pathogens. Cytotoxic T cells will be involved in directly attacking other cells. Okay, so these other cells just not the cells that are supposed to be there, which we would call cell cells. So those other cells begin to be attacked. And there's a couple different steps here that are going to occur. The T cells are going to dock to the major histocompatibility complex that's bound up on foreign cells. So these are the, the markers that have been put in place. So this is our point of interaction. And once we have that point of interaction established, then it becomes chemical warfare. And the cytotoxic T cells are going to douse that foreign cell in lethal chemicals that will begin to disrupt the membrane, begin to break down organelle, begin to destroy, begin to destroy the foreign invading cell. Now, this process of dousing the, the uh, invader with lethal chemicals is referred to as a lethal hit. And this is one of the main things that we have to accomplish in order to begin to eradicate those foreign invaders and begin to move the organism back towards a state of health. Now, after all of this occurs, those cytotoxic C T cells we're going to move on to find more invaders. 
find more invaders to begin to break apart and to eliminate from the organism. Okay, so we got the T, TH cells and the TC cells orchestrating the attack. And the whole goal here is just to begin to rip these invading cells or invading organisms, just rip them apart and destroy that and kill them. All right, final step here in the process, recognition, attack, and then memory. Okay, and memory is going to be this idea that we're going to remember the organisms that have invaded the organism before, and the next time we have invasion, we have the ability to attack in a more efficient, efficacious way to eliminate that invader before it really becomes an issue. Okay, that's not what I was expecting. <laughs> So we saw that. That's where we left off. Here's our next image here. And this is showing what happens to create this idea of memory. Memory all begins with a process known as colonial selection. Remember that we had colonial selection that basically primed an army to efficiently and effectively attack a given invader. In that selection process or that cloning process, we're going to have some TM cells that are going to be produced. And as we have these memory T cells that are being generated, We initiate this thing called the T cell recall response. Or we can initiate this thing called the T cell recall response because we have these TM cells. Basically, we have kind of this little subunit of cells. They're not going to be part of the invading army, but they're going to be a subgroup of cells that are primed so that they could attack. Those indiv that individual organism if it were to come back. Does that make sense? So you kind of have this little subset of TM cells that hold everything that the cloned army had. Now we get a second attack by the same microorganism or pathogen, and we can initiate the T cell recall response. Now we don't have to go through the process of identifying the organism and marking the organism and doing all of these steps, we can say, okay, here's the organism. This is what we used last time. And using that T cell little uh, group of, of memory T cells, we can begin to go through the cloning process to create more of those individual cells to initiate this T cell recall response. And really the take home message here is this leads to the presence of these TM cells leads to fewer steps that are going to be needed or required to initiate the same response that was just used in order to eradicate the initial attack by the pathogen or the microorganism. And so this results in a time frame that's very quick. And because it is quick, it's so much quicker than the initial attack that a lot of times you won't even have the effects. You won't even recognize that anything is, is invading your cells. They just get eradicated before they can get to a point where they cause pathogenesis. So everything that we just talked to up to this point was that special form of a third line of defense that's known as cell-mediated immunity. Now we're going to move on to humoral immunity. Now please remember that humor just simply refers to body fluid.
So in the process of humoral immunity, again, we're going to have tagging of the enemy cell, of the invading cell. We're going to have the B lymphocytes, again, that mark the enemy cells, and so we're going to have major histocompatibility complex proteins attached up and tagged to the enemy cells. So this process is very similar to what we saw with cellular immunity, but then it begins to deviate from here. And we're going to end up with other means of destruction. So we'll have some other means of destruction. Now the three stages that are involved in this process are very similar to cellular immunity by name, but some of the intricate details are going to be different. Okay, we're still going to have recognition. We still need to identify that there is a foreign invading cell. So we're going to have an immunocompetent B cell that is going to be covered on its cell surface with surface receptors. And the receptors that are going to be present, proteins that can bind to other proteins, they will be receptors for one particular antigen. there is supposed to be antigen, A-N-T-I-G-E-N. -E okay, so we'll have receptors on these immunocompetent B cells that can bind to specific antigens. And the antigens, again, are going to be found in the membranes, bound up in the membranes of a variety of different types of cells, pathogenic cells, and also some of the cells that exist uh, in your body, your, your own cells or your cell cells. Now, when we do have an active invasion, the recognition is going to come when many receptors are bound. And then that immunocompetent uh, B cell is going to actually internalize the antigen. So the antigen is internalized. This process right here, you should actually recognize this. So I have a specific ligand, the antigen, that binds up to a bunch of receptors, and that causes internalization of all those antigens. You know what it's called? No, no, no. I get where you, how you're getting that because of the receptor. So you've got receptors that bind up to a specific ligand, and then all those receptors get internalized into the cell membrane on the immunocompetent B cell. I get a little packet that gets pulled in. Somebody needs to go back and review their stuff. Intermediated into cytosis. What's that? <laughs> then you should have spoken. <laughs> so we get receptor mediated endocytosis internalizing all of these antigens. Now we're going to create uh, this immunocompetent B cell. Again, it's going to create. Um, and display, I should say, these antigen fragments. We basically now know, okay, 
here's an antigen that's present. It shouldn't be here. Any cell that has this antigen, we need to attack. And so the B cell is going to display those antigens or antigen fragments. They're going to be displayed on the cell surface. So bound up in the membrane. And this time we're going to use a major histocompatibility 2 protein in this presentation process. So here you can see, here's our foreign invader that has our antigens. A major two, or a class 2 major histocompatibility complex is present. This macrophage immunocompetent B cell is going to become an antigen presenting cell. So it takes in that cell, destroys it, those antigens get incorporated into our major histocompatibility complex, and then gets presented to the external environments or to the extracellular fluid. Okay, so this cell becomes a antigen presenting cell holding on to the viral or the bacterial antigen. Now, helper T cells are going to bind to that antigen. That's what the AG stands for. Major histocompatibility protein complex. So we're going to have an interaction between the helper T cell and that inter antigen, um, that antigen major histocompatibility um, cell, the, the antigen presenting cell itself. And in that interaction, this receptor on the T cell leads down to some cell signaling events that eventually leads to a change in cellular physiology. That change in cellular physiology is going to be an increase in the excretion of interleukins. So increase in interleukin excretion. We're going to have B cells that undergo colonal selection. To generate an army of B cells that are programmed against that specific antigen. Army of B cells that are going to be programmed against the antigen. So here you can see this interaction. The cytokines, interleukins are a type of cytokine, so we're releasing cytokines. And then we generate antibodies that can actually interact with our virus. And this B cell is going to go through a process of generating both memory B cells containing those antigens and then colonal plasma cells that will begin to secrete those. I'm saying antigen. I'm sorry, this purple is antibodies. Begin to secrete the antibodies. So we're programming this B cell so that it begins to generate these antibodies that are going to be able to bind onto that specific antigen that's present. So we have a point of interaction for, uh, that can occur between the B cell and, in this case, it's a virus, but it could also be a bacteria. Okay, and we're going to generate those cells programmed against that specific antigen expressing antibodies. Some of these B cells will differentiate to plasma cells. So we have the generation of our memory colony, but we're also going to generate clones of plasma cells. And this is really where it becomes quite a bit different humoral immunity versus cell mediated immunity. Because these plasma cells are going to now have the ability to produce an antibody. And that antibody is going to be specific for the antigen that is present because of that foreign invader, whether it's a virus or a bacterial cell. Now, leading, uh, leading away from the production of those antibodies, these plasma cells producing the antibodies 
basically just cause an inundation of antibodies in the blood and other body fluids. Okay? So now we have this increasing number of antibodies that are just everywhere inside of the organism, body fluids and blood, distributing all over. Antibodies, again, are just simple proteins. They're immunoglobular proteins. They're not cells or anything like that. So we're just dousing the organism with these antibodies. Okay, so how is the attack process actually going to occur once we've created all of these antibodies? So our antibodies or our immunoglobulins, antibodies or immunoglobulins will have or be involved in four different methods of effect. And the end result is to render the antigens harmless. Okay, so the antibody is going to actually be able to interact with the antigens that are coming from the virus or the bacteria or whatever the pathogen may be. And then there will be four different responses that occur. One of the responses is going to be this response known as neutralization. And what happens with neutralization is the antibody covers the active or the toxic regions of the antigens. And it just simply neutralizes their effect. The next method would be complement fixation. And with complement fixation, It works with the complement system. The antibody exposes a complement binding site. And then we can get that pore formation, that pore inserted into the membrane of the invader, and we can have the inundation of fluids to cause the cell to rupture. A third method is agglutination. In agglutination, the antibodies will bind multiple invaders. Fixation. Okay, that agglutination will hold multiple invaders. And what happens here is you just clump them together and they are rendered useless that way. So one antibody will be associated with many foreign cells or foreign invaders. Gosh. So one antibody, many foreign cells, and they just get clumped together, and then they're not as effective. They basically become harmless. The last is precipitation, and with precipitation, 
we're going to have an antigen molecule that bi binds up or is bound by an antibody. And by doing that, we make the antigen, we've increased its molecular mass, and then it just simply falls out of solution and can be rendered harmless that way. So on this figure over here, you can see that we can have neutralization of an antibody or of an antigen or a toxin. We can have clumping of foreign cells and agglutination. Uh, we can also have uh, things like antibodies that surround the virus or the bacteria and they prevent the viruses or bacteria bacteria's ability to uh, insert into another cell or to attack another cell. Activation of the complement system so that we get complement proteins involved and they can have their effects. Now the last thing that we need to do here is we need to generate memory and if you think back or let me even show you the previous picture, you know that you have your clones of memory B cells. You have that colony of B cells that are generated. So during that clonal selection process, so really B cells are being produced in that clone. This is happening actually prior to the attack, so this isn't a very linear sequence, but we have the memory B cells generated through the clonal selection. And again here what happens is oh, we want to respond by producing antibodies specific for a specific antigen or invader. We have a clone of memory B cells programmed towards specific antigens. Every time we have a new exposure we get a new small little group of these B cells that are, are going to act as memory cells and pre-programmed by this clonal selection so that the next time we have an invasion by this particular microorganism, we have a quick formation of our plasma cells that generate our antibodies. And they get produced in a very quick, short amount of time. And then we have those attack procedures. Neutralization of toxins, the agglutination, prevention of uh, a, a viral attachment, all of these things are possibilities. Everybody good on lymphatic system? We're now going to move forward. I'm going to move to a new topic. Yeah, Randy. Yeah, AG is antigen, AB is antibody. Is everybody good? All right, so start a brand new lecture. We're going to call this lecture, or we're going to start the lecture on respiratory system. Yes. This, yeah, this is exam three material now. We, we ended exam three, exam two, um, the end of, of Friday's lecture. All right, so the respiratory system. Physiologically, the respiratory system consists of four processes. And really, the four processes are going to be all about moving gases into and out of tissue. Okay? The first of these processes is what we would refer to as either breathing or more proper, properly ventilation.
this is one of the four processes. The, the process of ventilation is just simply an organism's ability to move air into and out of the lungs. So into and out of the lungs. Now, air, we're going to talk about the composition of air. So just recognize now that air, I'm talking about this mixture of gases that surrounds us at all times. And it's made up of things like nitrogen, oxygen, carbon dioxide, water vapor, and a few other very small, minute quantities of other gases. We're going to ventilate, we're going to move air into our lungs, and we're going to move it back out. And when we do that, we're going to be moving or exchanging gases with the external environment. Now, breathing or ventilation only talks about moving gases from the external environment into the lungs themselves. Once we're in the lungs, we need to exchange specific gases from that air that's just been breathed in into the bloodstream. And that's going to be the process of external respiration. So ventilation is just simply moving air in and out of the lungs. External respiration is using the gas components of that air that's been ventilated into the lungs to undergo gas exchange. Now we're going to find out that this gas exchange is going to occur across two cell layers. The cell layer that we find in the lungs and then the cell layer of the capillary to move the gases of oxygen from the air you breathe in into the bloodstream and certain carbon dioxide being produced by working tissues from the blood back out into the air that is breathed into the lungs to be expired back out. So gas exchange, because it's taking gases from one location and moving them to another location. And in particular, we're going to take the air gases, like oxygen and carbon dioxide, and move them to or from blood gases. So gases in the air to the gases in the blood, or blood gases from the blood to the air. Now, once I get, let's say, oxygen, let's just track oxygen for now. Let's say I've exchanged oxygen from the gas into the blood. It now goes into the circulation, so it goes absolutely everywhere. It comes out of the pulmonary circuit, gets distributed into the general circuit. Eventually, that oxygen is going to circulate to a working tissue, so to speak. Maybe you're running, so it might be the muscles in your leg. Maybe you're thinking, so it might be the tissue in your brain. Maybe you're eating, so it might be the tissue of the digestive system. We're going to have to have exchange. Again, it's a gas exchange process of gases from the blood to the tissue and vice versa. This is known as internal respiration. Internal respiration, we're going to have gas exchange And it's going to be it's going to be from the blood to the tissue and from the tissue back to the blood. Now, once we get oxygen into the tissue and carbon dioxide out of the tissue back into the blood. The oxygen is going to participate in the final process, which is cellular respiration. Cellular respiration, we're going to use the oxygen that basically, if you're kind of looking at this from a, a whole organism scale, oxygen comes in. It eventually makes its way all the way down to the tissue. Carbon dioxide comes from the tissue and comes back out. So the oxygen that comes in from the environment, from ventilation, external respiration, internal respiration, finally makes it into the cell. And at the level of the cell, it's going to be used to produce ATP. So it's used in the ATP process. Now, what happens to that oxygen when it's been used to make ATP? Does anyone happen to know? Is anyone really up on 
cellular respiration. Most people would say, oh, it gets converted into carbon dioxide. Which is false. In reality, that oxygen is being converted into a molecule of water. And then in the process, we get molecules of, of ATP. Okay? So once oxygen is converted into water, it's no longer oxygen. And so it basically just sort of disappears or vanishes. And that movement of oxygen from the external environment into the working tissue is continually pulled on because the oxygen in the tissue is being converted into water. Now, what about the CO2? We already know that the oxygen is not responsible to produce the carbon dioxide. And really what happens is the carbon dioxide is being produced along the glycolytic pathway. In particular, it's being produced as acetyl-CoA is distributed into the Krebs cycle. So you have acetyl-CoA that combines with oxaloacetate to produce citric acid. And in that process of moving pyruvate into acetyl-CoA, we have CO2 that's being produced. And that's where the CO2 is coming from. The end point here is that the carbon dioxide, which is going tissue to external environment, is always increasing inside of the cell. So oxygen has this pull because it's being converted into water from external environment into the tissue, where CO2 has this push because it's being produced in the tissue and needs to escape to the external environment. Now, I just painted a picture here for you very intentionally because I want you to begin to think about concentration gradients, and in particular, a unique type of concentration gradient that's based off pressure, called a pressure gradient or a partial pressure gradient, which is what we're going towards and eventually we're going to get to. But before we can do that, we got to talk about how do we get air to go into the lungs and get ventilated back out of the lungs. Then we got to talk about external respiration. Then we got to talk about internal respiration. Then we finally can get to what's happening with cellular respiration. Now, in the end, this whole process still needs some help. And the whole process of respiration from Ventilation to cellular respiration is going to be facilitated all along the way by bones, by muscles, by nerves, by the blood, by the heart, by cellular organism, organelle, etc., etc. Okay, so this is not just really a simple as moving oxygen in and getting CO2 out. We've got a lot of stuff involved here. All right, let's talk about the system anatomy. You can see a picture here that shows the major components of the respiratory system. And in its simplest form, if I can put this as simple as possible, the respiratory system is a set of tubes to get air into and out of the lungs. So it's just simply a set of tubes to get air into and out of the lungs. Now, when we look at this set of tubes, we typically divide it up into two divisions, or we break it up into two divisions. And basically, it's separated right about here, and we have an upper portion, and then we have a lower portion. And you've probably heard those terms used before. Oh, I have an upper respiratory tract infection. And we know where that infection is going to be centralized. It's definitely not going to be really deep within the lungs. It's going to be in this upper portion held basically within the face of the neck. So let's take a look here at the upper respiratory tract. The upper respiratory tract, the tubes, 
are going to basically terminate or begin at cavities. So the upper respiratory tract contains or consists of a couple different cavities and then we have this cavity of convergence that leads into the rest of the tubular system throughout the lower respiratory tract. So what are these cavities? And also openings, I guess, if I'm going to be complete about this. We have openings like the nose that lead into the nasal cavity, which is what you can see here. So we have our nostril, which is our opening. And then we have this big cavity in here where you can bring air into the nasal cavity. But you can also move air in through an opening called your mouth or in some of your cases, your pie hole. Is that like really mean to say? Which leads into an oral cavity. So the nasal cavity and the oral cavity, two different openings, and then they all converge, both converge into a structure called the pharynx. So this is going to be our cavity of convergence. cavity of convergence, which you can see, what did I do? Okay. Which you can see here in this figure. So here is our cavity of convergence. You can see the nasal cavity comes in through here, the oral cavity comes in through here, and we end up with this ca cavity of convergence called the pharynx or it also may colloquially be referred to as the throat. Okay, so let's talk about some of the purposes here for these different structures. Starting with the nose and the nasal cavity. The, the nose and nasal cavity, we're going to find purposes that are both, both respiratory in nature, but also extra-respiratory in nature. One of the purposes is the nose has these sensory receptors that help us to smell. And in all reality, this is actually more of a digestive system function than a respiratory system function, which maybe is surprising you. But think about it. If you have a bad piece of meat or fish, you're going to smell that, and you're probably going to say, uh -huh, I'm not going to eat that. And it's going to protect you because you're probably not going to get sick. So that's more of a digestive system function of the nose. The respiratory system functions include these little tiny hairs that we all have called nose hairs and these are going to act as a filter and what this does as you breathe in through your nose those hairs are going to begin the process of removing foreign particles so we remove foreign particles you can think of this as basically just beginning the cleansing process of air. I mean, the air is not bad around here in Cleveland, Georgia, um, but we're far away from population centers. There's not a lot of traffic and pollutants and things like that, but um, there still are particulates in the air, dander from pets and pollen from trees, and we want to remove all of this stuff before we really bring that air deep inside of our lungs. And that's going to start with these guard hairs, or these uh, nose hairs, rather. The nose and nasal cavity are, we're also going to use to add moisture. This, too, is a very protective process. We want to increase the humidity of the air we're breathing in. And part of the reason we do this, once you get deep inside of the lungs, we have a, a structure in our lungs that are known as alveoli. This is the unit of gas exchange 
for oxygen and carbon dioxide. This requires a relatively moist environment in order to maintain everything that is present in the alveoli to facilitate efficient gas issues. So if we don't add moisture to the air and we just breathe in really dry air, eventually we would dry out our lungs and our lungs would not work very well at all and it would be uh, not very advantageous for life. So we're going to begin to moisture, add moisture to the air. Um, we also want to warm the air. Now, body temperature we maintain right around 98.7, 98, well, let's just call it 99 degrees. So even today, you're like, oh man, it's such a warm day out there. It's only 70 degrees. We breathe in 70 degree air and we don't, if we don't warm it up, that would begin to drop our body temperature down. Once we got down to about 96, 95 degrees, which is going to be very easy to do, we begin to go hypothermic, even at 70 degrees outside. So we want to make sure that we warm the air up to body temperature. Now one more extra respiratory ability, and you've all experienced this before when you've had an upper respiratory tract. What happens to your voice when you have an upper respiratory tract infection? It, it kind of changes a little bit. And that's because the nose and the nasal, nasal cavity, we reverberate pressure waves through the nose and the nasal cavity to help define our voice. So this is going to add, the nose and nasal cavity adds to our ability to vocalize. That's why when you plug your nose, it sounds weird. I don't know why I don't have the oral cavity in there, but let me give you a couple, uh, just kind of a little side note here. The oral cavity in the mouth. The mouth holds our teeth, which is obviously for mastication, chewing up food, going to add in and mix saliva, begin the digestion process. You also have taste buds, which again, on one side make eating a real pleasure, but on the other side it's also protective because you can put a tainted piece of food in your mouth and it doesn't taste good. What do we do? We spit it out before we bring potentially bacteria and things like that all the way into our digestive system. Um, so we have taste buds that are going to be present. The oral cavity in the mouth are also uh, for um, respiration is going to help. Most of us don't breathe a lot through our mouth. We're, we're more no nose breathers, but we can breathe through our mouth, especially during high exertion. And that's going to help out um, as we breathe through our mouth, things like um, humidifying the air and, and warming the air as well. The pharynx has two jobs. One is to control the passage of food. And we want to send food to the right tube, which is going to be the esophagus, which is part of the digestive tract. And the pharynx also controls passage of air. And we want to direct that to the right tube, which will be the trachea. Okay, so we're going to talk more detail about how the pharynx actually does this, but basically the pharynx is the control center or control gate. And when we swallow food, we want to have food directed into the esophagus down the digestive tract. Uh, or when we breathe in air, we want to send air into the lungs, not into the stomach. Okay. If food goes into your lungs, we call that choking. <laughs> and it blocks your airway, and when it blocks your airway, the reason that it's so problematic is because you can't move air in to begin to facilitate that gas exchange and reduce oxygen flow to the brain and the heart. If you load up your stomach with air, it's going to be more complicated than that. When you load up air in your stomach, it can distend the stomach. And it, can, it can cause, well, yeah, it can cause bloating, but it can also can cause. Um, rupture of the, uh, the, the lining of the stomach can, can cause a lot of really serious problems. The most common way that air gets in the stomach is actually through CPR, the use of CPR instead of you don't you do uh, head tilt chin lift, and then you end up with air going down into the stomach rather than into the face. It doesn't do you any good at all. Thank you.